Our minds wander in all kinds of situations. Sometimes it's having to listen to a person who just can't stop talking. Sometimes it's having to do the same old thing over and over at work. Sometimes it's even our regular television show that gets boring and sends us to sleep. Yes, our minds wander and sometimes that becomes an obstacle to a healthy prayer life. We try to ask God or tell God something, but it's so hard to focus and so hard to concentrate. Well, today you're going to learn how prayer can become a real conversation that actually makes an impact. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Some of you may be a bit skeptical about prayer. You may question if it's a real connection with the Almighty. But let's face it, you've probably heard remarkable stories about answers to prayer. You've heard people claim miracles happen. And so, no matter what your background, I imagine that somewhere inside you, you'd like a good prayer life. You'd like to see things happen as a result. Well, here's one of the basic challenges most of us face. Our minds wander when we pray. At times, we find it hard to concentrate on that invisible God up there in heaven as there are so many other things in our heads. One day, a father was about to have supper with his teenage son, Jed, watching TV down in the family room. He bowed his head in prayer to say grace silently as an example. Just then his wife called out from the kitchen, want some fruit juice? Immediately, the father's head popped up, yeah, two glasses please. Jed, however, was grinning. He spoke dryly, wow, Dad. Some people are just so deep in prayer, they can't hear anything that goes on around them. Very impressive, this father did chuckle. But he also realized it's true. So often my prayers trickle into thoughts about unpaid bills or some sport event coming up. Yes, it's a challenge for almost all of us. Minds wander when we pray. So here's the first suggestion. Here's how we can really get our heads into prayer. Effective prayer is intentional. It's deliberate. It's not something we throw out as an afterthought or throw out on the run. We need to be intentional in prayer. We need to be awake. And here's something that helps. It's simple, but it's effective. Try praying out loud. Give it a voice. You can actually see that in accounts of Jesus praying in the Gospels. He often prayed out loud. He lifted up an earnest voice to the heavens. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, was having an intensely personal struggle. But he cried out in a voice the disciples overheard, as recorded here in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. My Father, not as I will, but as you will. The most intimate praying with God is not necessarily silent. Think about it. If I'm talking to a friend, I'm usually talking out loud. That's how we usually communicate about important things. So try it with God. Try praying out loud in a quiet, private place. It'll help you keep on track. It'll help you pray intentionally. Also, praying out loud works best in the right time and place. Look at this picture of Jesus' prayer life found in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. Now, in the morning, having risen a long time before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Christ went to a solitary place. Obviously, that's where you can pray out loud. And Christ also got up quite early. That was simply the best time for him. So are you a morning person or an evening person? When do you have the most energy? When are you most alert? When can you take a breath? 
what time of day. That's when you can begin a real prayer life. That's when your praying out loud will best help you focus and help you concentrate. Whatever your best time is, make it a regular appointment with God. That's how you start making prayer more intentional. A little boy was kneeling beside his bed with his mother and grandmother, softly saying his prayers. Dear God, please bless mummy and daddy and all the family and please give me a good night's sleep. Suddenly, he looked up and shouted, and don't forget to give me a bicycle for my birthday. His mother tried to calm him. There's no need to yell like that. God isn't deaf. No, said the little boy, but grandma is. Please remember who you're trying to reach. It's not about making an impression. It's not about other people. It's just about concentrating on a heavenly father. Now, the second element that will help you focus in prayer is praying with stimulating lines in mind. Yes, there are phrases, words that definitely stimulate your focus in prayer and they come from the Bible. Let me show you how this works from three general areas in Scripture. Firstly, verses from the Psalms. How many of those 150 Psalms have you read? Well, so many of them give us striking pictures of the God in heaven. And those images can help you focus more intently in prayer. Some examples. Here's Psalm 31, 3. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. A fortress. That's one of the big images in the Bible. God can make us secure. We can hide in that cliff of the rock. He can defend us. So when you have God, the fortress in mind, it's much easier to focus, asking him to lead and guide you. Here's one you've probably heard in Psalm 23, verse 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. Kneeling down, looking up as God as your personal shepherd, that helps you concentrate. The idea of this good shepherd who takes you to green pastures, who nourishes you, who takes you beside quiet waters, who brings you peace, that stimulates good thoughts, good requests. This Psalm 23 image is something that can help you move away from all the distractions, all the stresses that muddle up your mind. It enables you to aim at better things. Yes, the Psalms can stimulate your focus with striking pictures of God. Then there are the Gospels. Those are the four accounts of Jesus' life on earth. Well, what stands out in these books? Here's an example, Mark chapter 5. Jesus and his disciples had just crossed the Lake of Galilee, put the boat up on the sand. Just then, a man jumped out from behind tombstones nearby. Turns out he was the scariest, most dangerous man in the area, that is the region of the Gadarenes. People had tried to bind this lunatic up, chain his hands and feet. He somehow tore up the iron as he just couldn't be controlled by anyone. Well, the disciples backed away when they saw him coming. But spotting Jesus, the lunatic actually knelt at his feet. Jesus asked, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. In other words, this man felt possessed by all kinds of evil spirits, all kinds of destructive issues. What could Jesus possibly do? He commanded them all to go away, as if they were trespassers sitting in someone's house. Suddenly this lunatic is sitting there by Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And Jesus assured him he could become a witness, as described here in Mark chapter 5 and verse 19. Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. That's just one example of a person transformed, 
a person healed by Jesus' words, Jesus' touch. And here's the thing, those accounts can inspire extended prayers. You've probably felt at times that there were issues trying to take over inside you. But this Jesus can heal your heart. He can take out the old and put in the new. Focusing on one of these gospel accounts helps you focus much better in prayer. It inspires you to claim something good. Jesus' words make your words much clearer and much more intentional. Here's one more area in Scripture, the epistles, the letters of the New Testament, such as Galatians and Ephesians. They are so rich. They fill our minds with positive thoughts, as found here in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who wouldn't want those qualities? Well, the epistles enable us to focus on them, to see clearly what can come our way through God's Spirit. After laying out our problems in prayer, we can look at love, joy, and peace. Yes, aiming at qualities definitely helps you sail smoothly in a conversation with God. Here's a prayer the Apostle Paul laid out. He longed for believers to understand, found in Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 18 and 19. To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You see, in these epistles, love isn't just a word. It isn't just an abstract concept you nod to and then move on. It's something that can fill you up. It's something that has dimensions that can overwhelm you, that can stimulate your whole heart and mind. Yes, the letters of the New Testament make good qualities so vivid. They definitely stimulate positive prayer. So again, absorbing passages in the Bible, Psalms, Gospel, epistles, for example, can help build you a better prayer life. Jeremy had to commute every day, riding trains and subways in the huge metropolis of Osaka. He was a young man teaching English in Japan, and he had opportunities to share his Christian faith. But he also had challenges. These secular businessmen in his classes were a little skeptical about a prayer life, and he wanted to have a real prayer life himself. But his busy schedule, his long commute on crowded trains, was getting to him. Every day he would look across a station platform at all the other expressionless commuter faces. In a big city, you're surrounded by smirking ads, salacious posters, a crowd of elbows, countless staring eyes which never meet. Jeremy was finding it harder to concentrate, to be positive in prayer. So what was he to do? Well, he began writing verses of scripture in a little notebook, carried it with him, tried to memorize them. For him, it almost seemed a matter of spiritual survival. Could God really get in his head? Could he communicate something real, something present? to his English students? Well, one day Jeremy was staring gloomily out of the train window. Just another ordinary afternoon, off to evening classes, same old gray urban landscape. But suddenly, those memorized texts jumped out, just like this one here in Psalm chapter 29 and verse eight. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. Boom, a little burst of light in his head. Then other verses here in Psalm 29 rushed in. The voice of the Lord is powerful, majestic, strikes with flashes of lightning and makes Lebanon skip like a calf. Yes, it felt good to have a God like that in the heart of the city. His voice could accompany Jeremy. Then Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6 came in to make the point dramatic. God's words, it said, 
are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. Jeremy would later describe that experience this way. Maybe it didn't matter so much if I was tired or depressed or lonely on the train. God's words were going off like fireworks out the window. Now this young man could pray with a very bright, vivid kind of concentration. Now prayer felt like a real connection. After a while, a different scripture text stimulated him in a different way. It was Moses confronting Pharaoh about his Israelite slaves. He delivered these words from God in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1. Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. Jeremy realized the Lord didn't just call his people out of Egypt to rations in the desert. He didn't just call them out to learn survival skills. He called them out to a feast. And that's exactly what was happening to Jeremy's prayer life. He was banqueting away on the Word of God right there in the urban desert. The same monotonous scenes were passing by him. The same blank commuter faces were all around him. But he was looking out of a different window now. In prayer, he could taste and see that the Lord is good. Jeremy wrote about it this way. That little rush of scripture left me exhilarated. It was the first time I had seen how powerfully it can lift me out of my numbing environment. Yes, passages in the Bible can stimulate your prayer life in a wonderful way. And now I'd like to show you one more thing that stimulates focus in prayer. If we take an honest look at our prayer life as a whole, you know what we often find? Problems and difficulties. That's what we focus on when we pray. It's understandable, of course. Sure, we come to God when we're in trouble, when we're hurting, and that's okay. But what we don't want is this, having a negative focus in prayer, having problems at the center of our prayer life. Too often, prayer becomes a passive reaction to misfortune. We plead for help while falling backwards. Sometimes, people just keep praying about how miserable they are. That's not the kind of focus that can keep us going. So think about this. How can you make your prayers solution-centered? After all, God is a solution-centered being. Think about it. Think of all the things he could moan about regarding life on this planet. The whole Bible could very easily have been one long divine gripe session. There they go again, stealing, lying, fighting. But Scripture, all of Scripture, builds to one climax, the coming of Jesus and God's ultimate solution at Calvary. All of the epistles explain and amplify and glorify that solution. So if God is solution-centered, it makes sense to petition Him in a solution-centered manner. We're more in His wavelength that way, and it's a better wavelength. It helps us focus well. Positive prayer is simply about aiming more at where we want to go than what we want to avoid. Do you know why the disciples came to Jesus with an earnest request? Lord, teach us to pray. They sense something positive and powerful in Christ's prayers. They sense that He was really talking with the Father. They sense that He was making an intimate connection with God. A man named Jim was agonizing in bed in the middle of the night. His emotions were killing him due to an inappropriate romantic relationship. He needed to end it. But saying goodbye seemed to be fatal too. There were so many conflicts inside this middle-aged man. It was suffocating. In the past weeks, there was no air, no blue sky, no way out. There was just this impossible task of somehow telling this woman he would never see her again. This woman who had appeared the most wonderful thing 
that had ever happened in his life, but whom he now realised was bound up somewhere else. Finally, Jim managed to open up the Gospels. He tried to read something about Jesus' life, and slowly the solution-centred Messiah got to him. There was a clear way to talk to this woman in the right place at the right time, and not flood out emotions, but just calmly explain that he couldn't see her anymore. So that's what he focused on in prayer. Lord, you help me set up the time and place. You help me lay it out calmly. And suddenly, Jim felt some light coming into his dark world. A window opened up a very different view. Yes, he wanted to put his whole miserable self in Jesus Christ's hands. He wanted him to be his guide. As Jim kept focusing on a solution in prayer, he kept feeling very different. He wasn't suffocating anymore. Taking on this hard task of breaking up felt quite doable now. If Jesus had sacrificed everything, he could give up a relationship that just wasn't right. And Jim began to feel the love of Christ as never before. That potential of getting close to a wonderful Saviour seemed more tangible than ever before. Yes, solution-centred prayer does make our focus much more powerful. After all, prayer can be more of a challenge these days. We're bombarded by so many high-tech messages. We're distracted by so many images flashing around us, from mobiles to iPads to big screens. Who can really focus on an invisible God? Well, we can focus effectively. We can do it. Speaking out loud to the Lord in a quiet place at our best time of the day, we can concentrate on a heavenly Father, looking at passages of Scripture from Psalms, Gospels and Epistles, for example, will definitely stimulate a good aim. And finally, making prayer more solution-centred will help us focus much more effectively The good news is that we can all build a great connection. We can all have a healthy prayer life. So I hope you will begin your personal prayer adventure today. I hope you will see that there really is much more to prayer. There's more power. There's more joy. There's more learning. Prayer can be one of the most positive experiences in your life. Are you ready to make that investment? Are you ready to devote a time and a place? Are you ready to see this through, even if you've been disappointed in prayer before? I promise you there are good things waiting. God has wonderful things He wants to do in your life in response to a healthy prayer life. So let's get started on the journey right now as we pray. Dear Father, thank you for opening up lines of communication between heaven and earth. Thank you for listening. Thank you for caring. Please help us develop a real ongoing conversation with you. Enable us to concentrate in prayer, whatever our circumstances. Help us to focus in a healthy way. We dedicate a time each day to seek your face in prayer. We dedicate ourselves to this enterprise. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you've been inspired by this week's program, be sure to join us again next week when It Is Written will present another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. It Is Written truly is changing lives around the world. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.